This is the 50th New Zealand Christadelphian Bible School. Our third period speaker is Brother John Papel on growing closer to God. The subtitle for today is Wrestling Israel. This is the second talk in the series. The introductory reading is Genesis 32, verses 22 to the end. Good evening once more. So, we, uh, we started our series on growing closer to God yesterday, and we saw from the example of Ruth how we can grow closer to God by learning to spread our wings, and we interpreted that directly as the distribution of mercy. Different subject tonight, different character. Tonight, we look at Jacob. In particular, the nature of the distance between Jacob and God is somewhat more mental, somewhat more emotional, rather than the physical alienation that Ruth had experienced, Jacob, we're going to be talking about the instances of trust. Am I going to trust that God will take care of me? Uh, Underlying that question, of course, is the attitude, I want to take control of my life myself. I don't know how many people in this room are able to identify with that problem. I am, so if you are, then you, you stand with me. So I will understand the desire to say, I trust God, sort of, but I'd love to actually make sure that I can run it all myself anyway. And that's the problem that Jacob had. He wrestled with an angel. Brother Arthur, Arthur just read us uh, that passage. Your name will no longer be Jacob, says God, or says the angel, but Israel, meaning strength with God, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. A similar comment is made in the prophets. Jacob struggled with the angel and overcame him. He wept and begged for his favor. Well, that seems like a a wonderful crowning glory for for Jacob at this time, to have overcome one of the almighty host and received the blessing from him that he strove for. What does verse 25 suggest? And if you don't want to look down or you don't have that in front of you, don't worry. Verse 25 was the verse that says, when the angel saw that he could not prevail and could not overcome, he touched his leg and the sinew shrank. It's a bit of an open-ended question. What does that imply? Anyone want to have a go at that? It implies Jacob was a powerful man. Uh, Like the first half of the verse certainly implies that he's been wrestling, wrestling with an angel all night. The angel's strength was limited. He touched his thigh and a hollow shrank. Okay? What else might that imply? The angel was pulling his punches and the devil was... Now, why do you say that? I'm interested in that answer. Well, because if he had the power to, um, to, uh, to overcome him by touching the thigh, he could have done that from the beginning. He could have done that from the beginning. And not only that, but he touched the hip and made something in there, I'm not a biologist, I have no idea what's in there, made something shrink. What if he touched his heart? And that shrank. What if he touched his lungs? And they shrank. That verse implies that the angel could have won the struggle at any moment he chose. And yet, in fairness, the Bible clearly says, Jacob struggled and overcame we have an apparent contradiction right off the bat. If contradictions worry you, I I sympathize. I greatly enjoy them. (laughs) Because contradictions mean we've got something mysterious and interesting to investigate. One half of that is right, or perhaps both are, if we view it from one angle. Don't know. Something very fascinating is going on when we have an apparent contradiction. Here's what we're going to need to do. We've come in far too late. This is later on in in Jacob's life, Genesis 32. So what we're going to do is we're going to back up uh, uh, and approach this event again in context. And we're going to back up all the way to the beginning of uh, Jacob's life, back there in Genesis 25. Esau became a skillful hunter. Esau, of course, is Jacob's twin brother, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man, 
staying among the tents. Now, Jacob might feel justifiably shortchanged by that English translation because quiet is a little bit uh, lame, no pun intended, in terms of describing Jacob's character. The Hebrew word is tam. Elsewhere, it's either perfect, undefiled, or upright. So it's quite a compliment that the Bible grants him here. He was a good man in the simplest sense, and he stayed among the tents. He was a godly man, but he has a significant character flaw. And these are the people that God is most interested in, godly men and women. And if they have any character flaws at all, that doesn't matter. God will work with them. Sometimes the sandpaper feels a little painful, but he will work with them. He will work with us, and he will eradicate that flaw. That's who Jacob is. What is the nature of this flaw? We don't have to guess because the Bible will tell us. At his birth, something happens which the Bible, through the inspiration of God, tells us was meaningful and symbolic. We can't attribute the behavior of a newborn to actual intention, but the Bible says, no, this is relevant, this matters. After this, Esau's brother Jacob came out with his hand grasping Esau's, ho Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob, or Yaakov, uh, in their pronunciation. And the fact that he's grasping Esau's heel is very relevant in the Hebrew culture. The closest thing we have in any culture that understands rugby, so I'm in the right place, it seems, is the tap tackle. Your opponent has got past you, he's defeated you, he, is, uh, he has eluded you, and you have one chance to leap out and just slap his foot so that as he's running, his foot will be knocked behind his own other leg, and he'll actually trip himself up and fall to the ground. It's your last-ditch effort to actually trip your opponent. And the Hebrew idiom about grasping the heel was remarkably similar to the tap tackle. Whilst the tap tackle is a fair and legal move, in the Hebrew culture, the grabbing of the heel to do much the same thing was seen as a deceptive thing to do. Your, your, your friend, your colleague isn't even looking and you just grab their heel and trip them up. So, Yaakov, grasping the heel. It's a Hebrew idiom to mean to deceive or to take advantage of. Sometimes we've had the word Jacob translated as supplanter. That's similar. One who trips someone up is probably even better, although uh, longer. So right from the start, Jacob had unwittingly enacted as a baby the idea of grabbing the heel, which in Hebrew meant he's someone who's going to be a bit slippery in getting the better of other people. That was his character flaw. He was a politician, a manipulator, a machinator. That was Jacob's character flaw, so the Bible says. But nevertheless, God knew Jacob was Tam upright, a good man. So he said, and he prophesied, two nations are in your womb, he says to the mother, two peoples from within you will be separated, one people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. I'd like to suggest to you that that is one of the most profound and important biblical principles you'll meet. There it is in Genesis 25, it's existed even before then in Genesis 4. Every single pair of brothers that you will meet in the scripture with, as far as I'm aware, absolutely no exceptions. The firstborn will fail because he is fleshly, and the secondborn will succeed because he is spiritual. Starts with Cain and Abel and proceeds all the way down. You cannot name a good firstborn son who is presented among brethren. Samuel is a firstborn son. He's not presented amongst brethren. All the other pairings... Abraham was a second son. He wasn't the eldest. Isaac was a second son. He wasn't the eldest. Jacob is the second son. He's not the eldest. All of them, it goes all the way through. The Lord Jesus Christ is probably best seen as the younger brother of Adam. The first son of God is Adam, who was fleshly and failed. The second son of God, if you will, was the Lord Jesus Christ. And perhaps the most important uh, manifestation of that principle is you. You've all been born once. That man, that woman will fail and die. And perhaps many of you have been born twice. So for me, I was born in 1970 and I was born again in 1986. So I am 45 years old and my spiritual brother is uh, 29, if I've done my maths right. So I'm a 45-year-old 
and I'm a 29-year-old, twin brothers. And the lesson is, says God, that older brother, he better serve that younger brother. Because if that doesn't happen, both will die. Okay? So it's a massively important principle. It erupts here, it erupts absolutely everywhere, including the two testaments, the two kings of Israel, etc. You can barely find a passage of scripture that doesn't have that principle somewhere. So, it is decreed by God. The older will serve the younger. Jacob gets to be in charge. But to what extent is Jacob allowed to facilitate this end? And perhaps Jacob goes far too far in making sure this happened by using his heel-grabbing, his tap-tackle uh, style of working. We know these stories well. This is almost Sunday school material, so we'll move through it pretty swiftly. Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. There's a good brother for you, isn't it? Taking advantage of the fact that e Esau was virtually starving, and Jacob seizes, he wrestles the birthright out of Esau's control. In fairness, God has always promised that Jacob would get the birthright. I get that. But he has wrestled the birthright out of Esau's control. This does the same thing with the blessing. Isaac's getting ready to bless Esau, so he gets, he sort of machinates with his mother, and he dresses up, and he puts on the goat skins and whatsoever else, and he receives the blessing from Isaac by deception, by grabbing the heel. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness. This is Isaac blessing what he thinks is his firstborn son. An abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be lord over your brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. So, what were the birthright and the blessing? Basically, what was the birthright that went to the firstborn son? In tangible terms. Double portion. Excellent. Cold, hard cash and twice as much of it. Let's be, let's be uh, direct about it. And what was the blessing? What's recorded here as being the, the gift? Because sometimes we think in very ethereal, esoteric terms. There's very tangible promises here. Do you see what they are? Food and drink. Yeah, absolutely. And food and drink in a country where starvation was real from time to time if the, if the, if the harvest failed. So I guarantee you'll have food, food and drink. So you'll have twice as much money as the, uh, the, all the double portion of the, of the inheritance. Food and wine. And one other thing. What, are, what other thing is there? Oh, that is true. Uh, excellent. Thank you. That's, there you go. I've shown a crown. Authority. A seniority and authority. That's absolutely right. So he gets double portion of the inheritance, food and drink, and authority, including even the authority of the father. That's what it was. So I'm going to use these pictures throughout so we can keep track of what we're doing. That's what Jacob was promised. That's what Jacob got. But what was the consequence of his wrestling? The manner in which he obtained them also had consequences. What was the consequence? He had to leave his family. He had to leave his family. That's articulately put. I would have said he made his brother homicidally angry. <laughs> I've done that myself, and I noticed the difference. <laughs> I live 6,000 miles away from my family now, but that's unrelated. Promise. <laughs> <laughs> He made his brother homicidally angry, and as Henry pointed out, he probably never saw his mother again. Uh, if, we, if, if everything is in the record that we see, he hasn't ever seen her again. She had passed away by the time he was reunited with the family. So he lost a brother, effectively, to violent anger, and he lost his mother. That was the consequence of the wrestling. This is relevant. Store that in your mind, and let's press on through Jacob's life. So should Jacob have done that? Of course not. It was God's will for David to be king in place of Saul. But notice how David, the man after God's own heart, would not even take the opportunities that appeared to be handed to him on a silver platter. David has now snuck into the camp with his trusty of slightly psychotic uh, Lieutenant Abishai, and he's got all the way up to a sleeping King Saul to take the spear and the water jug. And Abishai says, Today... God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Let me pin him here to the ground. But David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? 
As surely as the Lord lives, David said, the Lord himself will strike him. David knew to wait upon the Lord, even in what looked like a gift-wrapped opportunity, possibly even from the Lord, to take the matter into his own hands. And perhaps an even better example, even beyond that of godly David, is of course the Lord Jesus Christ. It was God's will for Jesus to rule the whole world. It still is. And so the devil takes Jesus to a very high mountain and says, you can have it now. A few conditions, but you can have it now. And Jesus says, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The crowning example of the man who knew to wait upon the Lord. What was perhaps the, pri uh, excuse me, the precedental, what's perhaps the first biblical example of someone misbehaving by applying what you might call the shortcut rule? I know God wants me to have this eventually, so I'll take it now. It isn't Jacob, you see, before Jacob. It is, isn't it? Abraham and Lot? No, we, we've already uh, had an earlier example. Genesis 3, absolutely, Eve. God always wanted for man to have knowledge of good and evil. He had an entire plan laid out. God actually always wanted what the serpent has promised. You will be like gods. That is God's ultimate plan. Great, I'll take it now then, says Eve. Huge disaster. So, it's clear Jacob has misstepped according to his machinations. He doesn't stop there. He goes on. Now he wants a beautiful wife. And so he's told by his uncle Laban, who's almost as deceptive as Jacob himself, uh, to work for the girl. And he ends up uh, with Leah, and eventually he gets Jacob, uh, Rachel because he works a lot longer. How many years did Jacob work for Leah? Pardon? 14. I got a 14, I got a 7. This is the auction already, isn't it? I got any advance on 14, going once, going twice. I, I heard a lot of 7s. Are you happy with your 7s? Ooh, pardon? Zero. It's relevant, isn't it? He didn't work one day for Leah. Think of the emotional backdrop of that comment. He worked 7 years for Rachel, and then got Leah. And then he worked another 7 years for Rachel and got Rachel. So he actually worked 14 years for Rachel. By the time he, and, and uh, he's got Leah without having any effort. And he worked 20 years. What was the other six years for? Right. How must Leah feel? I am married to a man who's worked 14 years to get my cute sister and six years for cows. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. That sound like that. But it's, <laughs> but it's heartbreaking, isn't it? We laugh. I laugh too. But it's absolutely heartbreaking. I don't want to be. I have more sympathy, probably, for Leah than many other characters in the in the history of the Bible. And she lived with that situation and was faithful to her husband, even though she knew, I am not wanted. Every single day she woke up, she could look at her sister or even at the sheep and say, I am not wanted. That is absolutely crushing. This is, of course, the result of Jacob's machination of like, no, I must have the one that I want. Laban has to bear some responsibility too, it must be said. Do not take your wife's sister as a rival wife. Now, in fairness, the law came after Jacob, but God's principles are timeless. So it's not something Jacob should have done. He should have accepted the wife he was given at the hand of the Lord, I suggest to you. Unfair though that may have seemed, given what Laban did. But he is the man who wrestles. Israel wrestles. No, I've got to have what I want. I don't care how it's panned out. I've got to have what I want, and I'm smart enough, and I'm strong enough, and I'm cunning enough to make it happen. And he made it happen. Is that good? Well... It carries on. The flocks. I want the best flocks. I want the healthy ones. Jacob, who's as, Laban, who's as bad as he is, go into this scientific goodness knows what. I don't know if it's hocus pocus or real. I don't really care. And trying to deceive each other until, guess who wins? Jacob wins. Why? Because Israel wrestles. And Israel gets what Israel wants. 
What were the consequences of these wrestlings of Jacob? We've considered some of them, haven't we? Leah is unloved. The wives, the sisters, are now competing with each other. Before, they may well have been friends. We don't know. And the uncle, Laban, and his cousins are so angry, they dismiss him from the premises. And he's out. So he's now lost his brother, his mother, his uncle, his cousins, and he's got two wives, at least one of which is unloved. This is a mess. That's, therefore, the intro we should have had as we return to our opening scene. And he wrestles with the angel all night. And the angel wants to leave. But Jacob won't let him leave. Why won't Jacob let him leave? Because Israel gets what Israel wants, no matter what. And so the angel says to Jacob, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, strength with God, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. But I want you to hear a hint of irony lying in the air here. Jacob does have strength with God, but Jacob has completely misunderstood where that strength lies. It is absolutely not where he thinks it is, in those biceps that pretty much kept an angel pinned down for most of the night. Maybe the angel gave him a little hint, by the way, could have killed you any moment, have a think about that someday. <laughs> but what does the wrestling reveal about Jacob's opinion of God, particularly this one, but in a way any of them? It's a way open question, I realize. That he can take from God what he wants. Who said that? Yes, that's, that's right. That's, that's very right. That's clearly in there. I'm stronger than God, and, and the angel says, perhaps ironically, oh, you've just beaten God in a wrestling match. Congratulations. I shall now call you strength with God. But Jacob's still got a lot to learn yet. Why would he need to wrestle it from God? You can't wrestle something if you were going to get it anyway and you trusted that, right? What it seems to me that it reveals about Jacob's opinion of God is that God isn't really kind enough to bless him. If he wants a blessing from God, he's got to mug the nearest angel. <laughs> and there's humor in that, but I'm also deadly serious. What opinion must he have, have of God? Imagine that uh, if you're a parent and your children are going around the supermarket, and I'm sure they're always perfectly well behaved at all times in these things, <laughs> but imagine that in public your child is grabbing hold of your ankle and screaming, Mommy, Mommy, please feed me today, please feed me. And you're thinking, what are you, why would you ask that? I always feed you. How embarrassing. <laughs> and Jacob is wrestling with the angel as if God is so mean, so parsimonious, so unhelpful and unloving that blessings have to be dragged out from the heavenly host, even against their will. And this is something clearly where Jacob needs to do a lot of work, or God needs to do a lot of work with him. What's the consequence of this wrestling? Very simply, we know he wasn't able to walk properly again. Okay? That's fairly obvious. But wait a minute. We had a, we had a corroborating uh, verse earlier. Jacob struggled with the angel and overcame him. He wept and begged for his favor. Doesn't Hosea praise this as well from many, many years downstream? Shouldn't Hosea criticize if indeed this was the wrong thing to do? Hosea does criticize. This isn't praise. It's an indictment. Context is relevant. Let me put it in the other sentences that have been missed out. God will punish Jacob according to his ways, and repay him according to his deeds. In the womb he grasped his brother's heel. As a man he struggled with God. He struggled with the angel and overcame him. He wept and begged for his favor. But you must return to your God. So realize even Hosea has given the correct commentary. This is not what Jesus, uh, Jesus. This is not what Jacob should have done. He should not have wrestled with God. We still have this strange, curious blessing, though, don't we? We'll, in, we'll investigate that. We haven't forgotten it. But we're getting closer to being able to solve this problem now. So just a little summary so far. 
You have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. What did he struggle for? The birthright, the blessing, Rachel, the pretty wife that he wanted, the superior flocks, and the angel's blessing. But even though God had promised him all of these, well, not Rachel, not the second wife, but he promised him all the others, the consequence of Jacob snatching them out of the Almighty's hand by any and all means necessary, we can list the consequences. His brother was angry, his brother was murderous, he was cut off from his mother, his first life was, wife was unloved, his wives are rivals and angry with him, his family is angry, he's cut off with them, and he can't walk. That's the catalogue. That's what the angel knows. I think the angel is trying to call attention to Jacob. You've wrestled all your life, Jacob. How's it working out for you? How are all these results stacking up? Is this what you want? Can you not see? It's your own life. Every time you wrestle, you just add a negative consequence to the blessing God was going to give you anyway. And I think there can be no bigger lesson spelled out in the life of Jacob than that one. So I suspect what God is really saying to Jacob is he says, okay, I'm going to call you bicep boy. I'm going to call you Israel, strength with God. And in time, maybe you'll realize that the deceiver has been given a deceptive or ironic name, that Israel is going to come to an understanding about what it means to have strength with God, and so far in his life, he's got it absolutely wrong every single time. And yet he does have strength with God. He just doesn't know where that strength is. He thinks it's in his biceps to pin down an angel. He thinks it's in his brains to outsmart and outwit just about everyone that he's come across, which he has successfully done to his own destruction. But let's resolve this completely. <laughs> it's not just because uh, I'm a man and we have these slightly macho issues. Who won that wrestling match, really? Did the angel win because he could have killed him at any moment? Did Jacob actually overcome the angel, as the Bible says? When the angel saw he couldn't overpower him, he touched his hip, and his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. So, clearly the angel could kill him in a second. What, then, was true about Jacob not being able to be overcome? What could the angel not overcome? Very good. Who said that? Excellent. His, all the way from outside. Excellent. What is it the angel cannot overcome? His stubbornness. His will. And so it was a very real wrestling match. The angel could have killed him in a second. That's not relevant. He wants to see. He wants to wait and see. Jacob, will you see? Will you stop doing this? And I think many parents also wrestle with their children, often physically. I could kill you at any moment. I just want you to just calm down. Will you stop this? And it gets darker and darker and colder and colder, and the night goes through, and finally it comes to the morning, and the angel realizes it's really time for a cup of tea, and I'm kind of done with this. You're not going to get this, are you, Jacob? You just Today you're not going to get this. I haven't been able to subdue you at all. Physically, I could kill you, but that's not relevant. I haven't been able to subdue you. You really have continued to struggle with God to your own continued blindness. The angel crippled Jacob physically, perhaps as a starting point to help him realize you have strength with God, but it's not where you think it is. Did Israel learn his lesson that day? It may have been the beginning of recovery, but I think the answer no is better than the answer yes. Why? Because we know how much he went out of his way, and time does not permit us to investigate at length, to continue wrestling against everything, to know that he was the one power, powerful enough to protect Joseph. I'll give him a special coat to show his favor. I'll do everything I can to get out of my way, to go out of my way to protect my own son. Did he win? No. His own son got killed, as far as he knows. His brothers had actually done something else. But they told him his son was dead, and he went on and did the same thing with Benjamin too, and lost Benjamin temporarily as well. You might think I'm being very hard on Jacob. I certainly don't mean to be. Jacob was a godly man. And God was slapping him and slapping him and slapping him and slapping him because God loved him. 
I can work with you, Jacob. I can get to your godly core if you'll just let go of your determination to cheat and outwit and outsmart and outmuscle everyone on what you think is the road to victory. If you want to know what favor and disfavor looks like, that's the picture that comes into my mind. Jacob is constantly on God's radar screen. And often as the beam goes past, it's something of a sandpapering effect that Jacob doesn't enjoy. Esau, where's the chapter where God reasons with Esau? It doesn't even exist. This is what we mean by Jacob I have loved and Esau I have not loved. Esau isn't really even on God's radar screen. Caveats may apply, but that's, that's what I'm seeing. So don't think I'm being too harsh on Jacob. I don't think God is either. What happens next? Seven years of drought. You know that. Here's something I didn't know until vaguely recently when I really stopped to think about it is what that drought actually meant with respect to the birthright and the blessing and the flocks. All those things that God said, Jacob, I promised them to you. Do you realize what the drought did? It took them all away. Now, I would have thought, no, wait, God isn't a cheat. No, God is not a cheat. But those blessings he promised Jacob were all taken away. In the end, the drought was so severe that Jacob had to go as a foreign immigrant down to Pharaoh and beg for food. What were the things, what was the birthright anyway? The birthright was, uh, or one of the things he was promised or wrestled for, was all those flocks and herds. There's a drought. They're dead and or been eaten. They're gone. What else was there? There was all that food and drink. No, there's seven years of drought. There is no food. There is no drink. That's why he's going to Egypt, to beg for food and drink. What else was Jacob wrestling for and promised? The power, the authority. What authority? He's now a penniless, hungry immigrant begging an Egyptian f official for a meal. That's not power. That's gone. What else did he wrestle for? All the money, such as he has left, is useless. He can't eat it. What else did he wrestle for? Rachel, the beautiful wife. Guess what? She's dead. She's already died at Bethlehem in childbirth for Benjamin. What else did he wrestle for to protect his beloved son? Guess what? He's dead too, as far as Jacob knows. God took everything away. Why? I suggest because Jacob got it through his own deceitful cleverness and strength. And God knew, if I let you keep it under those circumstances, you're going to think that you are the author of your own salvation. And that will destroy you spiritually. So let me just take everything off you that you wrestled for. How do you feel now, Jacob? Finally, Israel stands before Pharaoh, old, homeless, lame, bereaved, and hungry. Finally, he has nothing left to wrestle with. And frankly, he has nothing left to wrestle for. Finally, no wonder he would say, few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, because finally, strength with God is weak. And he has to acknowledge it. There's nothing I can do. My biceps don't work and my brains can't help me. I'm in a situation where I've lost everything I thought my God promised me and I cannot myself get any of it back. Please, Pharaoh's official, please may I have some food for me and my family to eat. The ultimate in dignity and humility. What does God do next? It's it was excellent sign language from the back there. Superb. He gives everything back. For free. For nothing. And without Jacob being able to do a thing about it. Watch. Settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. Let them live in Goshen, which is in the Nile Delta. It's beautiful and lush there. The authority comes back. Joseph also provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food. Back comes the blessing that had been temporarily withheld. The Egyptians brought all their livestock to Joseph, and he gave them food in exchange for their horses, sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. 
all the flocks are back. Joseph bought all the land in Egypt for Pharaoh. He's now the richest family in the land. And Israel says to Joseph, God says, oh yeah, that beloved son you thought was dead? Yeah, why don't you have him back too? Why not? I'm God, I can do that. Israel said to Joseph, in a much happier mood, I'm sure, now I'm ready to die because I've seen for myself you are still alive. God gave it all back, and Jacob will know there's nothing that I did to make that happen. Now God has provided for me, and I know that God has provided for me. It was not my wrestling with the angel. It wasn't my sneaky, sneaky outwitting my brother or my uncle or anybody else. He's given it all back. Or has he? What's missing? He never gave back the second wife. And fair enough, perhaps also underscoring that's not something that he ever should have taken. This was not part of God's provision. Has Israel learned Israel's lesson? Which Israel do you think I'm talking about? Has this 20-foot concrete walls, machine guns, big tanks that go bang, uh, the world's best Air Force bar few, Israel is still wrestling. We can do it. We can do it by our own might. If the walls are high enough and the aircrafts have got enough missiles and, enough and the tanks have got enough technology and the fighters have got enough spirit, we can do it, we can do it, we can stay alive on our own. We can wrestle our way to victory even amongst all of these Arab forces trying to destroy us. Have they read Genesis? Really? Israel is still wrestling. This is one of the most, uh, these next few slides, are, is one of the most favorite things that I discovered probably in the last five years. This I find truly amazing. Watch what happens. This is going to start off just as a recap of Jacob's life. Israel wrestles. We've seen all that for all that stuff. Israel believes the beloved son is dead. Joseph was killed by wild animals, he was told. Actually, the beloved son was still alive because the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar. In fact, not only is he alive, he's the second in command in a mighty kingdom, the mightiest kingdom on earth being Egypt at that time. And Pharaoh himself says to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. He had Joseph ride in a chariot as his second in command. And in fact, the son is working, even though the family think he's gone, unrecognized for the family he loves, collecting together all the food during the seven years of drought, uh, during the seven years of plenty, to prepare for the seven years of drought. And then God takes everything away to teach Jacob, to teach Israel his true strength. And Israel finally sees his weakness. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been. At which point... God restores everything, except the extra spouse. He wasn't supposed to have that. And Israel finally sees the beloved son, and the sons of Israel worship the son. As we've been going along, you've seen the chapter numbers as they come through. That's the summary of what we've just seen. The history of the life of Israel is the history, excuse me, the future of the country of Israel. If you want to know, if you ever wanted to know what's going to happen in the future of Israel, you might say, yes, Ezekiel 38, Zechariah 14, Matthew 24, the Olivet Prophecy. Sure, but you never needed to leave Genesis. It was all mapped out there from the start. Watch, let's do it again. And this time we're going to be on the other side. Israel is a man, but Israel's also a nation. Israel wrestles. We've seen that today and every day in our papers. Israel believes the beloved son is dead. Yes, he died on a cross when the Romans killed him. He's dead, you know. Pity that. Nice guy. Not obviously the Messiah, otherwise he'd be alive. But the beloved son is actually alive because God has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world with righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. In fact, the son is not only alive, he's the second in command of a mighty kingdom, seated on the right-hand side of the father, 
I see heaven open, testifies Stephen, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And in fact, the Son is working, unrecognized, for the family he loves, in order to feed all who will come to him. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. And there we are. There's 2015. What happens next? You want to know? Read the rest of the chapters of Genesis. It's all there. It's been there since the very beginning. Next, God takes everything away to teach Israel his true strength. Indeed, I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured, the houses ransacked, and the women raped. And Israel will finally see his weakness. And well might they say, few and evil of the days of the years of our lives been. I expect those words will be uttered in spirit. And what will happen next? Well, God will restore everything. Jerusalem will be raised up high. Never again will it be destroyed. Jerusalem will be secure. What next? Oh, except the extra spouse. You weren't supposed to have that. All the nations may walk in the name of their gods, but we will walk in the name of the one God, the Lord our God, forever and ever. And all of these other dalliances we've had with other religions and other forms of thought will be dismissed, and they will not return. There's no room for the extra spouse in the life of the Lord God. And then Israel will finally see the beloved son. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn. And the sons of Israel will worship the son. And what used to seem to me like a rather flat ending to the book of Genesis suddenly becomes the most majestic picture of the kingdom as the sons of Israel will bow down in worship, prostrate before the beloved son. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Well might Jesus have said to the Pharisees, if you believed Moses as you claim, you would have believed me, for he wrote about me. Where did Moses write about Jesus? Several answers are available. Which is the most clear one of all? I suggest to you these last ten chapters of Genesis. There is as much a description of the latter-day prophecies as anything else you'll find in the pages of Scripture. And it's been there from the very beginning. The history of Israel mapped out in the life of the man Israel. And that was a wonderful discovery for me. I've never been happier than when I saw those things for the first time just a few years ago. How can I learn from Israel's experience? I shouldn't wrestle with my brothers. What am I trying to win? Just what am I trying to wrestle out of the hands of my brothers or the hands of my father that's going to have any value? For if it had value, my father would bless me with it anyway. People are often unreasonable and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are honest, people may cheat you. Be honest anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do well anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give your best anyway. For you see, in the end, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. God chose Israel, the one who insisted on trying to bring about his own salvation and his own protection. God chose those who love him, even if they struggle with that character flaw of failing to trust him, failing to wait upon his timing, and try and achieve everything themselves. If we read the life of Israel, the only thing the wrestling brought was pain and fractured family. Nothing else. Israel never rested anything else. Israel had immense strength with God because he loved God. It wasn't in his biceps. It wasn't in his brains. He just needed to discover where his strength with God truly lay. God can and will work with this type of person. And so as a, a final slide, another lesson for me, don't grab at God's blessings. Do I need to mug the nearest angel to get God's blessings? Israel says, yes, grab him, rugby tackle him here and now. And finally he learned, no. 
What strength do you think that son has that with that father? I suggest to you that son has more strength with that father than he'll ever know. But if he thinks it's in his ability to knock his father down, he's hilariously wrong. But the strength is there nonetheless. Fear not, little flock, says the father, for it is my good pleasure to give you the kingdom. No wrestling required. 